Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and in this part two of the Gilded Age Politics Recorded Lecture, we're going to talk about uh, the role of the Supreme Court at this time, um, as well as kind of cultural politics, and especially um, some a little bit of reforms that are going to come uh, thanks to the Mugwumps, uh, the group that kind of abandoned James G. Blaine, the election of um, uh, 1884, Law Grover, Cleveland to win. Also, what's women's suffrage movement doing at this time? Uh, the Jim Crow South. And then the last topic for part two is going to be the rise of the Populist Party, which is really important. So um, let's talk about the Supreme Court first. So basically, if you remember in part one, we talked about that the government's role is going to be kind of laissez-faire, hands off of the economy. Um, so that's the presidency in Congress. What about the judicial uh, branch of the government? And so... Um, Really, during the late 1800s, the residual powers, those which is basically the powers not delegated by the constitutions of the federal government, left the states with, with the primary authority over social welfare in the federal government, uh, or sorry, over social welfare and economic regulation. The great question in American law was how to balance the state's uh, police powers to defend the general welfare against the liberty of individuals to pursue their private interests. Uh, as the federal courts took up the battle against state activism, they found their strongest weapon in the 14th Amendment. Now, the 14th Amendment, if you remember, um, for those that have in U.S. History 1, an amendment passed during Reconstruction to provide citizenship for African Americans to really prevent the southern states from denying voting privileges to African American adult men. Um, the 14th Amendment was really not passed to protect corporations, but throughout the Gilded Age, um, the Supreme Court is going to use the 14th Amendment to interpret it to protect, um, oftentimes to protect corporations. Not always, um, but at times it does. Now, two court cases I like to bring up are Munn versus Illinois and Wabash versus Illinois because they, they seem to contradict each other. So, for instance, in Munn versus Illinois, the uh, first one in 1877 said that states could regulate interstate commerce. That means railroads that go across Illinois into Indiana or Illinois into Iowa or somewhere. Okay. But then in the Wabash case, just, you know, nine years later, it said that states had no power to regulate interstate commerce. Now, what's the difference? It's nine years later. Okay. The constitution didn't change, but what did change is those judges on the Supreme court. Okay. And so that's why um, it's, you know, both parties make such a big deal about um, who is serving on the Supreme Court bench. OK, so nonetheless, the reason the 14th Amendment, how they're able to kind of the corporations are going to hide behind this is corporate lawyers at this time are going to claim that a corporation is an individual and therefore cannot be denied due process um, and so forth. So if it doesn't make sense to you, that's understandable. Um, because it doesn't fully make sense to me either. I, I don't have a law degree, and so um, some of my attorney friends may be able to explain this a little better than I can. But uh, they, in 1895, the court ruled that the federal power uh, to regulate interstate commerce did not cover manufacturing and stuck down a federal income tax law. So it declared where the Congress had passed a federal income tax unconstitutional later, the 16th Amendment is going to change that. So one thing the Supreme Court did kind of uh, kind of hamstring the federal government by saying that uh, uh, of, of some of these different uh, Supreme Court cases and so forth, the right to regulate a monopoly or a trust because the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, in essence, made monopolies or trusts illegal. Um, the Supreme Court's going to protect it. But then later in American history, my man, Teddy Roosevelt, my favorite American president, comes in and said, no. Uh, and he breaks up Northern Securities and files 40 different trust, uh, antitrust lawsuits against monopolies uh, to get them to clean up their act and so forth. And the Supreme Court is going to rule in his favor, thanks to uh, uh, one of his, uh, his attorney general, um, Knox, was really a, a talented attorney general. Okay. Now, the 14th Amendment, here's actually what it says. Okay. And if you look right here, the underlying part. No state shall make or enforce any law which deprives any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So they're saying that state laws can't deny a corporation these things because they're these uh, corporate attorneys argued that the corporations were individuals, but whatever. All right. Let's look at some um, terms at this time to understand about business economics. 
Okay. So let's say that, that I formed a business. Okay. And I decided to open up a resale store to sell outdoor uh, backpacking equipment or something. That would be a formation. Okay. I formed a company, a retail stop. Okay. It, it's privately owned. Uh, ownership would typically be by an individual. Um, but then you're, as it goes public, it is owned by um, stockholders. Okay. Um, so controller management is uh, run by the owner or people that I might delegate to be a proprietor in the business. Okay. And then um, if it's a publicly traded company, then the shareholders um, would technically be the owners and so forth, but the shareholders are typically going to appoint like a CEO, a CFO or a COO, um, chief executive officer, chief financial officer and chief organizational or, or operations officer and so forth. Um, so net profits are lost. So net profits are what you gained after your, after, uh, you paid for all your business expenses. And then, um, if I was an individual owner, then I would uh, have unlimited liability, which means if I own any debt to the company um, or running my business, I would have to pay up on that. If I have limited liability, what that means is that that's, that's as, a, as a company is what goes public and it's traded on the stock market, shareholders have limited liability, which means they're not responsible for any debt the company may accrue. The only thing they can lose is the money they invested and any interest that may have occurred on, accrued on the stock market. And now with a uh, partnership versus uh, with, with a corporation, um, you have agreement between associates, partners. Okay. So like, let's say I own a, own a business with another individual, we have a partnership. Um, so it's two more individuals and we delegate things and um, we still have unlimited liability in the sense that if we uh, accrue debt, we have to pay for it. Okay. But if a corporation, on the other hand, uh, organized by associates legalized to a state charter. So like a incorporated, you ever see uh, INC at the end of a company that means they've been legally incorporated um, and ownership of stockholders and how controls is the board of directors um, who are elected by the, the annual shareholders. Okay. Now um, who gets the money instead of just me as a business owner, or any partner I might have the dividends go to stockholders. Okay. The value of stock going up equals profits. And uh, like I said, it's limited liability. You only lose what you put in and any interest you may have accrued. Okay. A conglomerate is where a group of unrelated businesses owned by a single corporation. All right. So let me give you an example. Mars Petco. I have a good friend of mine that works for their corporation in Nashville. Mars Petco owns um, a bunch of candy bar lines and pet supplies. So those are unrelated businesses. Okay. And so forth. The a pool um, is where companies who are in a, a competing industry agree to fix prices. Now, later that's going to be declared um, illegal, but at this time they were able to get away with it. A trust um, is, is basically like a monopoly, but what you do is um, sometimes it's either run by a single board of trustees or what you do is let's say you have the a, uh, CEO of AT&T. Um, he might serve on the board of trustees for Verizon or T-Mobile. They're competing companies. That's kind of a conflict of interest. That might be a trust. That way they can work together to fix the prices. So that way they all um, aren't ruthlessly competing against each other. So it's not good for consumers. And a holding company, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt was, was really good about this. He would buy the stocks of competing companies to eventually he's a majority shareholder. And so you own it without actually owning it. All right. So trusts and monopolies are outlawed today with the Sherman Antitrust Act. Okay. So some people argued that a trust monopoly um, is not bad. They can make goods cheaper. Okay. And they can lower their prices to consumers. Now, Teddy Roosevelt didn't have a problem with a trust monopoly so long as it offered fair um, prices to consumers and, and treated their workers well and gave everybody a fair shot. Um, what he didn't like is exploiting the consumer or exploiting the worker and corrupt monopolies is what he would call them. We've, we've talked about vertic vertical and horizontal integration um, and the capitalism and labor PowerPoint, but I want to reemphasize it here. Vertical integration mean, means you control every facet of the production process. Horizontal integration is where you buy out your competitors through a holding company or buying them out or uh, with a trust where you're each servant on each other's board of trustees. 
All right. Now, the first government attempt to government regulate uh, an industry is the Interstate Commerce Commission. We used to say, I used to say this, I know it's cheesy to my high school students, but ICCI Choo Choo Train. Okay, that's how you remember it. Those are railroads. And so um, it was the first attempt by the federal government to regulate a business. Okay, railroads were the most powerful business enterprise at that time um, because they impacted every industry. Um, and so now the re- what ends up happening is it's kind of like a shark with no teeth um, because the people who got to serve on the Bo- uh, Interstate Commerce Commission were appointed by the actual um, um, railroad companies. Well, that's a conflict of interest. Okay. Now, the Sherman of Anti- Antitrust Act of 1890, which I mentioned briefly, uh, was designed to outlaw monopolies, but it had too many loopholes, not effectively used until Teddy Roosevelt comes into office uh, as president in the early 1900s. All right. So in the age before movies and radios, politics ranked as one of the great American forms of entertainment. I know that sounds crazy. So in part one, these are the groups that supported the Democrat Republicans, stereotypically, not always, but stereotypically, um, and so forth. Um, besides geographic sections of the country, the most important determinants of party loyalty, religion, and ethnicity. Statistically, the Northern Democrats tend to be foreign born and Catholic, or Republicans tend to be native born and Protestant. Among the Protestants, the more pie, uh, pietistic a person's faith that is, the more personal and direct the believer's relationship to God, the more likely he or she was to be a Republican and do uh, favor using the powers of the state to uphold moral values and regulate personal behavior. During the 1880s, as ethnic tensions built up in many cities, education became an arena of bitter conflict. One issue is whether instruction in the public school should be in English. Immigrant groups often wanted their children taught in their own languages. Um, religion was even more explosive educational issues. Catholics fought a losing battle over public aid for periodical schools, so Catholic schools, which by night was prohibited by 23 states. Um, and so forth. Also, blue laws went into effect that uh, restricted activity on Sundays. Uh, in many states, evangelical Christians pushed for, pu- push for strict licensing uh, and local uh, and a local option uh, laws governing the sale of alcoholic beverages. Because the hottest social issues of the day were, were also party issues, they, they lent deep significance to party affiliation. All right, so big thing on temperance at the state level. All right. So let's look at this. Um, here are kind of how organizational politics were broken up. So you had a precinct or a ward. OK, so whatever voting precinct I would be in uh, in Arkansas or Texas, um, that would be where I'd vote locally. I'm also uh, I previously lived in Dallas County and Collin County in Texas and, and uh, Faulkner County and so forth and Jefferson County in Arkansas. Um, and then the states, OK, Texas and Arkansas, two states I've lived in. National committees, so whether I vote Democrat, Republican, um, Libertarian, or or something like that, you'd have a national committee. And then you also have political machines that tend to control a lot of local politics. Um, Yet the record of machine politics was not wholly negative. In certain ways, the standard of governments got better. Disciplined professionals, veterans of machine politics proved effective as state legislatures and congressmen uh, because they were more experienced in the give and take of politics. More important, Party machines filled a void in the nation's public life. They did informally much of what the governmental system left undone, especially in the cities. So as I mentioned previously, um, political machines do some good, okay, but usually their corruption outweighs their bad. Or, uh, their corruption outweighs their good, I'm sorry. So changes thanks to the mugwumps. These are the uh, uh, Republicans that left the Republican Party uh, of James G. Blaine and voted for Grover Cleveland in 1884. <clears throat> Northern states began to impose literacy tests in order to limit the voting rights of immigrants. The secret ballot, um, um, an important an import from Australia, widely adopted around 1890. And that's a good thing, we have a secret ballot. Uh, continued the anti-democratic campaign by the mug ones who favored a more elitist role within the Republican Party. Um, and so anyway, that's not necessarily good. The mug ones were reformers, but not on behalf of social justice. Um, so reformers for themselves. Let's talk about women's suffrage. So if, if those are having U.S. History 1 during the Reconstruction lecture, we talked about how the, the women's rights movement split. And so you had an American Women's Suffrage Association, a National Women's Suffrage Association. One pushed for the right to vote in um, state level and one pushed for at the national level. Okay, so the American Women's Association, state level, national, American Women's Suffrage Association, national level. But they're going to reunite again in 1890, thankfully. So they do have a happy ending. 
Um, and so women could vote on local issues such as in the states of Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, and Utah. Um, and they could also, uh, they could write to vote for school boards or on tax issues. Okay, now the WCTU, uh, this is the Women's C Christian Temperance Union. It was led by Frances Willard. I want you to highlight, star, and underline her name and know who she was. She's a very influential woman in American history and uh, frequently appears on tests and quizzes. Um, and so she um, became the leader of the WCTU. She was also not only a temperance fighter, she was a suffragist. She was involved in a lot of stuff and even labor reform. Um, she also focused on trying to outlaw uh, prostitution. She pushed for better public health and international peace. So the lady is a Renaissance woman. She goes for a bunch of different things. Um, they did bring about a state prohibition law in Iowa uh, in the early 1880s. And they also um, pushed into founding a prohibition party, which was already in existence. Not much change in the short run, though. At the national level, Republicans remained against prohibition and against women's suffrage. For its part, the WCTU abandoned Willard's political activism, dropped out of the suffrage struggle later. There is Francis Willard, the, the woman, the myth, the legend. All right, let's look at um, race and politics and the New South. Okay, basically, um, Democrats try to prevent African Americans from voting in the South. Okay, um, they limited their access to jobs, the courts, and social services. No law segregated public accommodation, however, and practices varied across the South. So some states, you, some areas you had more segregation than others. Railroads were legally segregated, and the Black Belt areas were African American, some out, sometimes outnumbered whites. Gerrymandered uh, voting districts ensured that white, uh, while Blacks got some offices, political control remained in white hands. Um, blacks were routinely intimidated during political campaigns. So there's ways that Blacks were prevented from voting. Uh, you have literacy test, poll taxes, grandfather clause, property test. Grandfather clause means if your grandfather didn't vote, you don't vote. It was a way to allow poor whites to vote and keep poor blacks from voting. Um, it was very racist and prejudiced at that time. Um, now, we're going to talk about the, the uh, populist party in a little bit, but a lot of Southern tenement farmers voted populist, but they denied black membership. And so eventually blacks are going to form their own populist party, which is called the Colored Farmers Alliance. So, literacy test, they go to read and write to vote. And later when African-Americans could read and write, um, they made the literacy test very biased and prejudiced so that they still prevent voting. Property test, poll taxes, grandfather clause. Okay. Now, one of the things that you'll see as well is um, the populist party beginning to form. And, um, particularly um, Thomas Watson and Bill Timmons of uh, South Carolina stood up for poor whites, uh, but did not include blacks because of the prejudice of the day. Now, one of the most inf infamous Supreme Court cases in American history is what's called Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, it ruled um, in 18, it was actually only one Supreme Court judge that ruled in favor of Homer Plessy, but Homer Plessy was a man that if you would have saw him walking down the street, you probably would have assumed he was white. He um, was interracial, and part uh, part black, part white. And at that time, blacks were discriminated against from sitting in whites only cars on the railroad. So to challenge the law, they were hoping to bring this to court and, and they were effective at bringing it to court. Homer Plessy purposely sat in the all white car. Now, the, the train conductor would have no clue that this guy was part African-American. So there was somebody that was set up to report him that he was sitting in the all white car and that he was part black. So the conductor hears about this because of the setup. He tells him he has to move. Homer Plessy refuses. They threaten to throw him off a train and arrest him. And so they do that. And then he sues to claim discrimination. So it was it set up this court case. Um, but the Supreme Court ruled eight to one that Homer Plessy, um, that you could have separate facilities so long as they were equal. OK. Um, and so you, you, you see discrimination against blacks. You also saw it in the American Southwest and against Hispanics in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and some of California, and also Asians face this as well. Um, so another thing that's happening at this time is really one of the great, um, uh, tragedies of American history and it's what's called lynching. So, um, now lynchings occurred against white and black people 
Uh, but primarily the ones against African-Americans were the most notorious and much more numerous in, in overall percentages and, and, and some of the most ruthless acts of violence in American history. The greatest rates of violence in American history racially is actually, we have statistics of, we don't have statistics during the slavery time period, but it was between 1880 and 1920. Um, let's say somebody committed a crime, okay? And you also had many cases where they didn't commit a crime, but it was accused that they were committed a crime and you would still have lynchings. But instead of going, being arrested, going to trial, you have your innocence uh, assumed until you were proven guilty. And then you're tried by a jury of your peers, which is the due process of our um, our court system, they would, um, a mob would might uh, get somebody out of jail. Um, let's say they were accused of rape and then they would lynch them. They would uh, tie them up to a tree and lynch them in front, in front of half the town or they would set them on fire um, and some other God awful ways of, of killing somebody um, and, and so forth. Um, but you, you did have uh, people that were criminals that were denied uh, due process, but many times it was because um, an African-American man was supposedly associated with a white woman without any kind of laws being broken. And uh, you had lynchings that way. It is it is horrific. Um, there is much you can read about uh, this particular topic in American history. Um, it, it is it is downright uh, hard to stomach for some of it. So let me give you an example of one uh, case of lynching that I remember from grad school because my uh, master's thesis advisor um, included this in a chapter in her, her one of her books that she's written. It was a county in East Arkansas um, where it was a sharecropper um, who the, the owner uh, of the farm he worked for was, was ruthless and a, a punk economically to him, kind of exploited him. They got into an argument. Um, he was beating him and so forth. And the African-American sharecropper ended up killing um, the owner of the farm. Well, he fled um, to um, knowing that what probably was going to happen to him, um, a um, lynch uh, posse went after him. They captured him. They brought him back. And this is horrendous. Instead of uh, allowing him to go to trial uh, of a, and, and um, have a jury of his peers, they tied him to a log uh, and burned him alive in front of the entire town. Men, women, and children observed this. So let that sink in for a moment. Now, um, a famous courageous um, journalist at this time named Ida B. Wells uh, launched a movement and uh, through newspaper um, and, and out of Memphis called Free Speech um, to bring to attention nationally what was happening uh, with lynching. And lynchings occurred all across the country, including like states like Washington and Minnesota and others. Um, she was actually ran out of Memphis at one point. Um, and so some blacks were said, you know what, screw this. And they were drawn to this back to Africa movement, abandoning all hope that they would ever find justice in America. And they began pushing for the African-Americans to move back to Africa. Here's Ida B. Wells. Sometimes you'll see Ida Wells Barnett. Sometimes you'll see uh, Ida Barnett Wells. Um, I've seen her uh, said different in two different textbooks. So anyway, courageous woman for her era. Now let's get to the populist. Okay. Populists are very important. Um, a very important topic that will definitely be on your test uh, and quizzes. So what happens, let's, let's look at how the populace evolved. At first, it was farmers that began to unionize and they formed at the local level and that was called the Grange. Then they expanded to the state level called the Farmers Alliance. Okay. And eventually the Farmers Alliance got together and formed a national political party called the People's Party, but oftentimes they were called the Populist. Okay, so we covered this in the American West recorded lecture, so I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, they did get local laws passed called the Granger Laws, um, but don't really do anything at the national level. So we talked about Monbert's Illinois, allowed states to regulate interstate commerce, and then Wabash said, nope, you can't. So um, Farmers Alliance state level started in Texas, and then they moved across the country. The Granger is a little more social than political. The Farmers Alliance is the opposite. It's more political than social. And they end up winning um, control of eight state legislatures um, and had about 47 representatives in Congress during 189. So that's impressive. Now, so they decided, you know, in order for us to be more effective, we have to form at the national level. And the Populist Party is, among the, is probably the most well-known third party in American history. OK, so who was the Populist Party? They did want to gain control of the Democratic Party. Well, Northerners that were populist wanted to just run as a third party. 
So um, in 1892, 800 met in St. Louis to try to, and actually they did admit uh, African-Americans at the populist level. Remember the Farmers Alliance uh, in the state did not want African-Americans, but uh, the Northern part of that was like, no, we need to have African-Americans. So um, anyway, they, um, uh, some laborers, uh, labor union members also joined the populist party. Now this is an anti-populist party political cartoon. They call it the, the platform of lunacy. Um, saying that they wanted all this different junk that uh, they thought was foolish. So they run their first presidential candidate in 1892. His name was James B. Weaver, uh, and he got about a million popular votes. But the significant thing, because he didn't win, but they won a few congressional seats, particularly in the Great Plains states. That is big time. Okay. Now, there were some other prominent populists as well. Now, before I get to these proper populists, Harrison, um, who had won the election of 1888, lost to Cleveland in 1892 because um, really they felt like that uh, because it was debt and so forth. Um, and uh, they felt like that Harrison's party was a little more, uh, his government was a little more corrupt and, and that they, they gave away the surplus and some people were unhappy about that. So, but Cleveland, he comes into office and he walks right into the Great Depression of the 1800s. It's called the Panic of 1893. It lasts four years and it sucked. Okay, contributing causes were the splurge of overbuilding and speculation, labor disorders, and the ongoing agricultural depression. Now, um, some of these prominent populists, such as Mary Elizabeth Lee, she was grew up in the corn growing part of the country and she urged farmers to raise less corn and more hell. Uh, and then you had uh, these two guys um, that uh, Ignatius Donnelly and, and William Coyne Harvey um, got elected to Congress. OK, so um, that is that is significant that both of those people actually were able to obtain that. Now, what do the populists stand for? Okay. They push for uh, more of a what becomes a Federal Reserve. Now, one thing to keep in mind when I'm going over this, you'll see that some of this stuff the federal government implements. OK, so there's some aspects of the populace that's socialist. Um, and so the progressives that we'll talk about in module two will adopt some things that the populace support, but they will not adopt the socialistic aspects because the progressives are not socialist in the early late, late 1890s and early 1900s. So they wanted a system of sub treasuries. They wanted to get rid of the national currency and, and make it gold and silver. They do want direction of a, a direct election of centers. So number one comes about in Woodrow Wilson's Federal Reserve Act. Number three comes about with the 17th Amendment. Number four, though, they wanted government ownership of railroads, telephone, and telegraph companies. That's socialism. The progressives don't adopt that. They wanted government-operated postal savings banks. Also doesn't happen. Restrictions on undesirable immigration. That does come about technically with the um, immigration restrictions of the 1920s that we'll cover later. Also, an eight-hour workday for government employees. Um, that does come about in the progressive era and abolition of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, because oftentimes they were hired to break up strikes and so forth, uh, such as like the Homestead strike uh, that we covered in the capitalism and labor lecture. Also, this does get implemented um, at kind of the very beginning of the progressive era, the Australian secret ballot and the remonetization. So they do get more silver coin, but not as much as they want. And they wanted a single term for president and vice president. Obviously, that that hasn't happened. So they did want government ownership of a lot of infrastructure like railroads, steamboats, telegraphs, telephones. That does not happen um, because it, it's socialism. All right. Um, and uh, most Americans were not socialistic at that time. So election of 1892, Cleveland wins. And uh, this political cartoon is saying that you can't have both gold and silver. It's going to create instability or instability. And um, they are going to... Um, not be able to to see it be successful. All right, we'll come back to this in part three.